Hi, everybody, and welcome to another fantastic, incredible episode of 30 Days of Hope. I hope that you've been experiencing encouragement, empowerment, and just having that time of truly just finding community within this video series of 30 Days of Hope. Now, I'm so excited. Grab your coffee, grab that chai latte, grab that water, and pull up because we're going to have a wonderful conversation with a good friend of mine, Dr. Jake Dean Hill. So welcome so much to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Colleen. Uh, this has been so fun to see all your episodes, and uh, I'm so honored to be included. Oh, definitely. It's a blast. So, and we go way back. <laughs> so we're, we're part of the same doctoral group, so we have those inside jokes, those fun times. Uh, so it's great to see you face-to-face -face again. Yes, yeah. You've been missed. Ah, uh, you too. I love your love your energy. I love uh, just your your joy that you uh, exude, and uh, it, so it, glad to be a part. It keeps me going. Jesus and coffee are my go-to. <laughs> <laughs> so, great. and just a little bit of background on you. you now, you are a marriage and family therapist, which I'm sure has been very different going from face-to-face -face interaction, talking with your clients, talking with people to really switching to face-to-face -to -face via Zoom or even on conversation via telephone. So yeah. what has it been like to go from one to the other? Gosh, that's a good question. It's been quite the transition. Uh, obviously, I used to see probably 90% of my clients face-to-face uh, yeah. -face. Mm -hmm. and to move completely online or via phone has been you know, quite the change. And, and some clients are easier adjusting than others. Uh, but it's been really good. I, I'm grateful for one that we have the technology to do that and I can still help my clients. I can still meet with them. Uh, and I, I, I was telling you earlier that it's also helping my exercise program. Yeah. Because, uh, I'll walk around the block multiple times uh, during a session and it's been <laughs> it's been a double benefit um, but uh, a lot of clients are uh, adjusting well and they are um, getting you know used to this idea of you know what I can still get the help I need yeah. even though it's via phone or, or video and the fact that we can at least see each other uh, on the screen is better than nothing uh, so Good. but the anxiety definitely is higher uh, and so clients who already struggle with that uh, they're definitely having to find new ways to cope yeah yeah so. and, and I'm sure also too those that really struggle with anxiety or depression and feeling like this time is a place of isolation you know not being able to have any sense of normalcy or stability or even just kind of um, going to the gym or going to the nearest coffee shop, having some way of feeling like you can get out must be really frustrating. Oh yeah. It's, it's hard, especially, you know, my introvert clients, they, they look <laughs> love at it. <laughs> people and they're like, what's the problem here? I've been doing this for years. <laughs> um, but my extroverted clients definitely are getting cabin fever and are desperate to find ways mm -hmm. to connect with people and, uh, and they forget that they can still call people on the phone. They can still, yeah. uh, you know, do video chat. Uh, and so I have to remind clients to find a new routine that, that keeps them doing healthy things. Yeah. Yeah. And you were even mentioning some great, innovative, creative things that you're doing. So you and your wife and your family to stay connected to friends and family. How, how has this changed your idea of, building friendships, having relationships, and, and finding community? Yeah, it, it's definitely, obviously absence makes a heart grow fonder kind of a thing, yes. and realizing how much you just took for granted, hanging out, going on a double date with our friends or whatever, and the, as the weeks go on and realize we haven't done dinner in a movie forever, and we didn't realize how much that fed us and not just socially, but emotionally and just being able to, to have that fun playtime. And so, you know, we've tried to innovate and, you know, find ways to connect uh, via, you know, video 
and and just you know enjoy a cup of coffee virtually yep. with each other. And, yeah. And that's been it's been rich. And and when we do it, it's like uh, we both kind of sit and go, "That was nice. Why didn't we do that before?" And I've heard families where now they're doing these big group family Zoom uh, meetings and they're doing them every week and they kind of go, why did it take us mm -hmm. having this COVID-19 to actually have this routine where we connect and see each other on the screen? And so I think it's going to create a new normal for a lot of families that have been disconnected, but now they're checking in more now because we're more concerned or we want to make sure everyone's healthy or safe or yeah. yeah it's so. created like this beautiful togetherness. And I know for me, it's, it's like this awareness of, you know, what is my normal? What, what do I really am grateful for that I've really taken it, it for granted? And one of the biggest things that I miss is actually going to my favorite coffee shop. And I'm like, I miss my baristas. I miss just connecting. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes, the coffee was great, but just that sense of community and trying to figure out, all right, how do I take this and then still find that online? Right. Yeah. It's the relationship. It's, yeah. it's way more than the, than the coffee. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how much this is going to really turn into almost the old version of Sunday night at grandma's where it's like, you know, getting together for dinner, connecting with people. If a lot of families are going to make sure that they check in every single week to continue these Zoom discussions and make sure that they're, they're close with family. Oh yeah. I mean, people have had more family time, forced family time than ever. And, you know, I notice it's, it's either forging or frying yes. different families <laughs> because they, hmm. they're, they're playing more games. They're, you know, having yeah. just more conversation, you know, more play time and, and quality time. And it's really neat to see because they're forced into that situation, they mm -hmm. have that. It's also, you know, causing a lot of struggles because families aren't used to spending this much time with each other and they're having to get used to navigating those relationships. And, and so it yeah. definitely has some bittersweet uh, elements. Yeah, very much baptism by fire. What, especially kind of tapping into your specialty of being a family and marriage therapist, what would be some advice that you would give spouses right now where it's like they love each other, but they're not used to seeing each other 24 seven hours a day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like when my wife uh, slips her cold feet in bed uh, over to my side and I say, <laughs> I don't love you that much. So <laughs> <laughs> there's a limit. <laughs> there's there's a limit. <laughs> I mean, I love you a lot, but yeah. I don't love you that much. So I think families are couples spending that much time together. Obviously they love each other and I joke, but, uh, what I, what I'm talking to couples about is that just because you're married and you're in the same house and, and you're kind of stuck, doesn't mean you can't schedule alone time or schedule time, you know, with the kids, without the kids, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, know, you can still do dates. Uh, and so what maybe they used to go and be apart from each other during the day at work, they can, you know, create that to where, hey, you go to the shop or I'll go to there, you know, we'll, we'll take our time. And sometimes couples feel like they, they can't do that because mm -hmm. they, they need an excuse. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it kind of keeps, you know, people sane. And, you know, just like sometimes parents where, you know, some parents will say, I'm not cut out to be a stay at home mom or dad. Mm -hmm. And they, them going to work or having that you know, refuge, they are a better parent as a yeah. result. And I think that goes for couples too, that couples can be better for each other if they have that balance and, and have that time apart. Mm -hmm. So I, I encourage people to, to just schedule that and, and to get a new routine that allows them that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it makes you aware of understanding, okay, what makes me tick? How do I actually fill myself up? so that I can pour out and that, you know, the people that I'm living with, whether it's roommates, family, or spouse, don't get the worst in me, but they get the best in me. But, but taking that time to really kind of figure out 
what makes me tick? What fills me? Um, and I know like you and I are both extroverts. So it's trying to figure out how do we fill ourselves as extroverts <laughs> so that we're good for our families. It's true. I'm one of the people that are like going stir crazy and, <laughs> and trying to know what to do with all this alone time and, and this downtime. Uh, so yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. And one of the things that I love about you and your wife is you have, you have this beautiful, not only belief, but also practice in what you actually label gender balance. And you covered it in your thesis. So just give us a sneak peek about, you know, what is gender balance and how can we actually take your theory and then use it right now, especially within online communities? That's a good question. Yeah, I, I took this whole idea of gender balanced leadership and I created a website called gendersynergy.us. Uh, and the whole concept is how do we capitalize on the synergy, the unique synergy of male and female coming together and leading together? And, mm -hmm. you know, that, that applies to marriage, that applies to churches, you know, workplaces corporate world and the the concept is that we're better together uh, that there is uniqueness in us as male and female that a lot of times we can't put our finger on but it is crucial in how we make decisions how we become effective in what we're trying to accomplish and if I can be a part of helping to coach organizations and teach people how to appreciate each other more and not where we just get to this place where we allow the other gender to be a part, but that we develop this need, mm. this, uh, this desire, like I don't want to do this without my other half per yeah. se. Uh, yeah. And I know with everything being online now, sometimes you don't al always have what you would normally if you're sitting around the same boardroom table or whatever, where you can really pick up on the body language or the feel of the room. Sometimes that's missed in, let's say, a Zoom meeting. And so, and because women tend to be less competitive they let they tend to be more collaborative and more relationally oriented in terms of wanting to make sure that everybody is included and heard from a lot of times they will defer to whoever uh, is the louder voice and i know that one of the things that's going to be crucial in these processes of online meetings and and such is for the people who are especially the men who are leading in those meetings to be deliberate about including the voice uh, of female and mm -hmm. including people in the meeting who maybe wouldn't speak up unless spoken to yeah and and they need to be invited to yeah. be brought out so that it it, it conveys a feeling of oneness and a feeling of inclusivity that I value your opinion. So I'm not going to just talk over you. I'm going to invite that. Yeah. Yeah. Which is so pivotal right now. And I think for those watching out there, you know, all of us stem from different backgrounds, different faiths, different denominations. And we might be wondering, well, wait a minute, how, how could this be? How could women, you know, wait for permission? But a lot of it also too is very generational. And mm -hmm. I think as leaders, we need to realize that people have been brought up to be a little bit more subdued, to be a little bit more quieter. And as Jake was saying, this idea of collaboration, camaraderie, and relationship sometimes has been taught and ingrained in women especially. So especially if you're a millennial leader out there, don't have the assumption that every single person acts on the lateral level of equality understand that everybody stems from a different perspective and a different background. You might need to offer different questions. You might need to give people permission and make sure that their voices are heard. So really take this into consideration, connect with Jake. I've known him for years. He's a great coach that can really help you through this process. Awesome. Yeah. I think there's so much to learn in this area and I, I've just so enjoyed unpacking this 
and I, I just love to see the results of when men and women mm. are working side by side and accomplish that synergistic uh, element. Yeah, yeah. And it's really, and, and I think also too, it has that idea of participation, which people are longing for. A lot of people are really questioning the church structure because mm -hmm. it's been so hierarchical for years that how do we actually create that collaboration? And I think what you're doing is so pivotal to that because it's saying, all right, here's, here's a way, here's a stepping mm -hmm. stone to really reach that. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Well, how, how are you personally finding hope, finding happiness, um, really building memories, especially with your family right now? Oh, gosh, just the quality of time. My, my kids are home from college and that was unexpected on their part and our part. And so we're adjusting to that. But it's so fun having them here uh, and being able to just play more games and, and spend more time uh, with them in conversation and gosh, uh, finding that time to, you know, read some devotional thoughts and, and listen to just inspirational music. I'm just so impacted these days uh, with uh, different songs that I'm either seeing on the internet or, you know, people send me that, are just very inspiring to me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fun sitting in the in the family room doing church on Sundays in front of the TV, and being able to do church with my family like I haven't been able to do for years because they've been gone off to college. And so uh, that definitely gives me hope. Uh, I think knowing that we can still make an impact. Uh, around us even during this time whether it be with neighbors or just making a phone call or encouraging somebody uh, that it gives me hope to to help be uh, an avenue of hope to others too yeah definitely that's great great advice and just before we end this especially for those that are watching either they themselves or family members are really struggling with anxiety i mean i think all of us are sort of you know, we're showing signs of anxiety or PTSD, and there's a lot of things that we're acquiring that maybe we didn't quite deal with before. Yeah. What would you say to people within that place? And what are some steps that they can do to reach out to really find that support that they need? Mm, good question. Yeah, definitely. Uh, anxiety is much higher right now, just because uh, people don't know if, if they're going to catch the virus or going to give the virus or, you know, they're affected by the their economic situation with their jobs. And uh, so the, the first thing I tell people is always stop long enough to feel mm. and, and make sure that you're acknowledging the fact that I have some fear, I have some anxiety. When you ignore that emotion, uh, it festers and it, and it gets buried and it doesn't just dissipate into the groundwater. Uh, and so first thing is acknowledging the anxiety, acknowledging that emotion. Uh, and, and sometimes that means taking some time, journal, you know, get alone with yourself to, to identify that, which most people are afraid to because they think that's going to make it worse if they lean into that and acknowledge that. Uh, but it actually allows that emotion to settle and, just like other people like to be heard when they're speaking to you, your own body and your own psyche and emotions like to be heard by yourself. Uh, and so the other thing is finding things that are nurturing to your spirit, your soul, and making sure that those are a part of your routine. Uh, exercise is hugely important. Eating healthy, uh, making sure that you're, getting in that healthy routine. Um, another thing is um, finding people who are support to you. There's people in your life that can be more toxic and there's people who are very supportive and encouraging and finding those people that you can center into and, and lean on and say, Hey, I just could use an encouragement. I tell people all the time, don't be afraid to call your friend and say, can you call me once a week and check in on me and encourage me because I'm struggling. That's a very vulnerable thing to do. 
but it's very healthy. It's very healthy to express that. And most people that you would express that to are so grateful because they will be saying the same thing. Like, ah, oh, I feel anxious too. It's so good to talk to you. And so it's all, it's 99% of the time it's going to be mutual when you reach out in that respect. Uh, and just making sure that you're monitoring that and not ignoring uh, that emotion and that you're speaking truth. That's the other thing is that sometimes our mind gets in a very irrational loop and we have to stop and say, okay, what's the truth? What, what's the truth about my situation? And obviously uh, if you have a faith, uh, definitely you know, bringing that, to the Lord in prayer uh, and, you know, relying and, and putting your faith into action. Uh, but overall, you, you want to make sure that you're replacing the lies with the truth uh, that are trying to derail you. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Great, great advice. I love the fact that you talked about the idea of just being honest with yourself and just taking time to, you know, allow your emotions to speak to you and allow what you're, you're going through so that you can actually see what's really true. Um, I know I've really found it comforting to just journal right now. I love just kind of getting out my journal, going through my thoughts, going through what's happening. And it helps me to really be grateful too, because it puts things in perspective of, okay, this is where I'm at, but what is one thing that's given me hope today? What's one thing that I've, I found, even if it's the sun was shining, um, it helps me get to the next stage, the next day and the next week. Yeah, it's so healthy. It's just so therapeutic to just be able to acknowledge those and see those words stare back at you. Yeah. And yes, I'm glad you brought up, brought up gratitude because I recommend that all the time. Mm -hmm. Gratitude, uh, does wonders. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. So, well, thank you so much, Jake. I really appreciate you being here and just connecting. Um, it's always great as you were talking about connecting with people on Zoom. So, connecting and, and staying with yes. us. Yeah. Thank you so much, Colleen. It's so glad to see what you're doing and so want to bless you and bless your efforts. Uh, thanks so much. So, and for all those people watching and listening, you can find more about Dr. Jake Dean Hill to connect with that website that he was talking about for coaching and for advice and resources so that you can truly make your online community a place of gender inclusion so that every single person at the table can be heard, feel valued, and understand that they have worth.